Hello everyone and welcome to Reproducible Teach, our summer session. Um, in today's video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to use reporting guidelines to improve transparency and reproducibility in your research. So we'll start off with the most important question, what is a reporting guideline and why should you consider consulting a reporting guideline? Um, and I'll give you a quick overview on this topic in this video. So reporting guidelines are very useful for identifying essential elements that research should address when designing and developing their research studies. These types of reporting guidelines are often created through expert consensus. So groups of experts meet, discuss what items are really important to report for reproducibility and transparency, and then they build the guideline around those discussions. Different elements in a guideline may be included for a different reason. For example, some elements may be there to provide an overview of the study aims and the study design. Other elements may be reported to enable others to reproduce the experiment that you did. Um, there may be elements like ethics statements that are there to confirm requirements with existing regulations. And lastly, there may be elements that are listed in the guideline because they provide information needed to assess scientific rigor or the risk of bias. So here's an example of one guideline that includes different elements for different reasons, and they're very clear about stating why different elements are included. And this is an arrived guideline or the ARRIVE guideline, which some of you may already be familiar with, and it is designed for researchers who are doing preclinical animal research. So the guideline is divided into two sets of elements that one should report. The first set is the essential 10, and these items are the most important elements for reproducibility, and hence they should be reported in every paper. The second set of items is the recommended set, and these are additional elements that, the author, that all authors are encouraged to report, and they include items that are critical for other reasons. So, for example, the statement of ethical approval appears in the recommended set because it's important for assessing compliance with regulations, although it's not necessarily essential for reproducibility, so it's not in the essential 10. There are a number of reasons why you should follow a reporting guideline, both when you're designing your experiment and when you're conducting your experiment. The first is that these guidelines offer a rigor and reproducibility cheat sheet. So experts have already discussed and decided what it is that you need to report and what matters for reproducibility. You just need to report these things. The second reason is that it saves time. So many journals have already endorsed common reporting guidelines. And if you write your draft using these guidelines, then you won't need to take time to add this information during the review process in response to comments from the editors or the reviewers that you haven't followed the appropriate guideline. And I just want to emphasize that really it does save time. Um, the items that are included in reporting guidelines are often things that are really critical to report to allow someone to assess the scientific rigor, the risk of bias, the quality of your experiment. And if reviewers don't have enough information about the study design, they may not be able to fully evaluate, evaluate your experiment and their reviews may come back inconclusive. So this can lead to requests for additional cycles of reviews and revisions or extra rounds of revisions. So when is the best time to consult a reporting guideline? Well, the best time to consult a reporting guideline is when you are first designing your study. At the design phase, you want to ensure that you know what you're going to be required to report and address at the end. And this allows you to make sure before you even start your experiment that you have addressed all points, including regulatory issues, as well as aspects that are important for rigorous and reproducible study design. And you can also make sure that you have a plan to record all information that you might need later. So, for example, the sex of the animals or your human participants and so on and so forth. You might be thinking, well, that sounds great. However, I've already written my method section and it's a bit too late to consult a reporting guideline, isn't it? And the answer to that is no. The second best time to consult a reporting guideline is today. So even if you've already completed your experiment, you can still be transparent about what you did. You may not be able to change your study design, but you can ensure that readers have the information needed to evaluate that design 
for the risk of bias and other factors that affect rigor and reproducibility. And more importantly, you'll learn what factors you should think about when you are designing your next study. You might be thinking, well, if I've known about the reporting guideline earlier, I would have changed some things in my study design. And here it's important to remember that no study is perfect. So if you find that you might have done things differently had you seen the guideline earlier, that's okay. You just want to acknowledge the potential limitations in the limitation section of your discussion. And it's important to note that every paper needs a limitation section. You should always have a limitation section in the discussion section of your paper where you describe the limitations of your study. And then you want to remember these things that you might be able to address when you're designing your next study. So what if it's not possible to follow all of the guideline elements or you identify some elements that aren't relevant to your research? What should you do then? Most important thing here is to explain. So if you couldn't follow a particular item, then provide a justification. So it was not possible to do this thing because, and then explain why. If the item is not relevant, then just state why not. So X does not apply to our study because, and then give your reason. One of the really critical important questions to think about here is which reporting guidelines should I use? Um, I will highlight a few very well-known guidelines that are very common, although I would say that many of you who are working on these particular types of study designs may already be aware of these guidelines. So if you are doing a systematic review, then you want to look at the PRISMA guideline. If you're working on a clinical trial, you want to look at the CONSORT guideline. If you're doing an observational study with human participants, then look to the STROBE guideline. And if you are doing preclinical or biomedical animal research, then the ARRIVE guidelines 2.0 is the one that you should look at. If you don't already have a guideline that you're using or you're not, none of the study types that I listed on the last slide really apply to you, then I would recommend that you start with the MDAR guideline. So MDAR is an acronym for Materials, Data, Analysis, and Reporting. Um, it is a very, very general guideline that is relevant to many types of biomedical studies and it's endorsed by many journals. And I provided a link to one of the many journals that publish this here. And if you go to Appendix 3 of that guideline, you'll find the guidelines checklist. The other parts of the document contain explanations about how to use the guideline, what's in the guideline and why. Um, the first appendix of that document has information about what they're looking for in each each element of that checklist. And then it's also important to note that other guidelines may be relevant depending on your study type and your study design. So let's talk a little bit more about some common reporting guidelines that you might use if you're doing a study with human participants or um, if you're doing medical research that involves animals. In this case, you want to choose the guideline that matches your study type. So I mentioned some of the big ones, CONSORT for randomized controlled trials, STROBE for observational studies, and PRISMA for systematic reviews. However, there are a number of other common guidelines that you can see here that are listed on the Equator Network website. And if you go to that website, then you can follow the links to each of these guidelines to get the actual guideline itself. Um, a couple of additional notes here. If you're working on a systematic review or meta-analysis, PRISMA is the main guideline. However, the Moose guideline also provides a lot of beneficial advice if you're specifically doing a meta-analysis of observational studies. For preclinical animal research, I mentioned that ARRIVE is the main reporting guideline. There's a second guideline called PREPARE that addresses additional elements to consider when you're planning your study. And so it's best to look at PREPARE early in the study design phase. So what if you don't see your study design there listed there? Um, where might you find reporting guidelines for other study designs? And here again, I would suggest going to the Equator Network website just to see if there's something else that might be a better fit for the type of study that you're doing. And the website address is listed on the website, although you can easily Google it as well. Okay, the Equator Network is most useful for human and animal studies. And animal studies, it'll mainly have the ARRIVE guidelines. So what should we do for those researchers who are working with in vitro research? 
Um, here again, I would suggest that you start with the MDAR guideline. That will be the most simple and straightforward. However, I will list a couple of other options here that you might want to take a look at if they're helpful for your particular research area. Um, so the first one is the OECD guidance on good <clears throat> in vitro methods practices. This is a very large document. Um, I do encourage you to check it out if you're looking in the in vitro space. There's also a set of minimum information about biological and biomedical investigations. This is a portal that has 39 different guidelines. Um, one caution if you're using this, many of these guidelines are older and have not been updated, so you want to see if the items requested are still relevant for today's methodologies for the particular guideline that you're looking at. And then there's also a book chapter here that's quite helpful for in vitro studies and methodologies. I mentioned briefly the OECD guidance document. Um, this puts a lot of emphasis on chemical safety and stability and defining standards. And there are a number of other things here. I won't go over to the slide in too much detail to save time, but I would encourage those of you who are doing in vitro work to have a look and see whether there are things in there that are helpful to you as there likely will be. Okay. There are a few other quality recommendations that you might want to look at depending on the type of in vitro work that you're doing. So one example is guidelines for cell line authentication as well as the guidelines for the use of cell line. And then there's also a chemical probes database, um, which may be valuable for those of you who are working with chemical probes. And lastly, you can also look for reporting guidelines for particular types of methods that you use. So some examples are the ENCODE guidelines for epigenetic experiments, um, the MIQE or MIC guidelines for qPCR, and there are also some minimum reporting guidelines for Western blot methods. And depending on your specific methodologies, you may find other guidelines that are relevant to you. One last thing I'd like to mention is that regardless of your study type, all studies should follow the Sager guidelines. And the Sager guidelines are specifically about sex and gender equity in research. Um, and so you can again find these quite easily, but this is just a table from the guidelines that are listing the general principles of things that they want you to report regarding the sex or gender of your participants or your animals or the samples that you are analyzing for your study and this can include cell lines. Okay, so the Sager guidelines are beneficial for all study types. So if you're working with in vitro research, it's important to report the sex of your cells. And with human animal studies, the Sager guidelines are relevant even if you're not investigating sex differences or if your study only includes one sex. And there's a link there to the guidelines for your convenience. What might a reporting guideline include? Well, reporting guidelines may contain four elements. It depends on the guideline, which, which of these elements and how many of them will be there. So the first thing is the guideline itself, and this is usually a fairly concise statement about what items you need to report. The second thing you might find is a checklist, and this is typically a bullet point list of each required items with space for the authors uh, to add the manuscript page numbers where each item was addressed. The last thing is the explanation and elaboration document, and these are detailed documents that provide information about good reporting for each item. If your guideline has an explanation and elaboration document, always consult these documents. They're really helpful in telling you what that item, what each item of the guideline is looking for and how to address that item effectively. And then there may be some additional information, so the guideline might describe the methods used to develop the guideline or provide some added context to help you to interpret the guideline. Okay, so you may be thinking, okay, we've talked about a lot of guidelines here, do I just need one? For the purpose of this of this course, we recommend that you start with this with one guideline, um, one of the ones that I listed on the first slide, so Prisma, Consort, Strobe, Arrive, or the MDAR guidelines or the Sager guidelines. We recommend that you start with one of those. However, you may want to add more guidelines to your repertoire over time to encompass different aspects of your work and further improve your reporting. <clears throat> 
So the main guidelines that I just mentioned are very general guidelines or, or guidelines that were developed specifically for common study types, and that's what we want you to do here. However, you might need guidelines for other specific types of issues. So for example, guidelines for, for a specific research area might address items that are particularly important for your field. We talked about how you might look for guidelines for a specific laboratory method that you're using. And there's also something called core outcome sets. These are things that describe which outcomes should be measured to determine effectiveness in clinical trials for particular disease states. And so if you're working with clinical trials, I would really encourage you to see whether there's a core outcome set available for your clinical trial. These you absolutely must consult when you are planning your study because they are about what you should be measuring. So you might be thinking that's a lot of guidelines and you are correct. Um, feasibility is really important here. So again, we recommend that you start with one major general guideline that's most relevant to your study type or the Sager guidelines or and the Sager guidelines and use these guidelines for the purposes of the class and your next study. And in the future, as you are more comfortable with those guidelines, you may find other guidelines that are useful for your research that you might want to add to your writing and study planning and reporting routine. So you might be thinking, okay, so if it's not listed in the guideline, I don't need to report it. And the answer here is not necessarily. Um, Guidelines often offer a minimum starting list of what is what is important, so take a guideline as a starting point. They are generally, or it's generally guidelines are written for a very general audience, so no guideline can anticipate every single type of study or experiment that a researcher might do or address essential details for every specific subfield. So if you know that something is really important for your subfield, just go ahead and address it and make sure that it's reported. And then as you're reporting, you always want to think about things from the perspective of your reader. So what would she or he need to know to understand your experiment and to reproduce your methods? You might be wondering, is it really necessary to report all these things? So maybe your colleagues have published lots of papers without reporting key elements that are listed in the guidelines, or you've noticed that papers published in your target journal you don't usually report all of these things that you're finding in the guideline document. Um, here I want to emphasize that transparent reporting helps future you, and it also helps the scientific community. So having a very clear record about what you did benefits you and your lab members because this, although you are living and breathing every detail of your experiment right now, you may not remember those details five years from now. The other important thing about detailed methods is they make it easier for you and others to understand your research and exactly what you did. Good reporting helps others to evaluate the risk of bias and assess the quality of the evidence as well as reproduce your methods or implement the techniques that you've used in their own research. And it's finally the last point I would make is that if we want to improve reporting that starts with us and we can do that as authors by following reporting guidelines and writing detailed methods, but also as reviewers and editors by asking others to do the same. So you might say, I've seen guideline elements reported in some fields, but not in my own. Um, it's important to remember here that good practice evolves over time. And there are things that, you know, maybe they need to be reported now, but weren't reported previously because the technology has changed. Um, or because our understanding of what items impact reproducibility has improved and changed over time. It may also be that new guidelines have recently been released that have changed the standard of reporting for your field. And finally, it's important to remember that some fields adapt faster than others. And if you happen to be following standard practice for your field, you will never be asked to justify it. It's simply assumed that that's the way people do things. And so looking at fields that are a little bit further ahead can help other fields to improve and integrate better practices. And finally, I'd like to emphasize that the fact that something is standard practice in your field doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best way of doing something. 
And so as a resource here, I've listed this Science of Science reading list. This has a lot of very accessible meta research and science of science papers that address common practices that are also problematic and explains better ways of doing things. Um, this list has a lot of different papers on it and it will help you to identify and fix common problems in the scientific publication. So how do you let readers know that you used a reporting guideline? You want to cite the guideline in your paper and adjust the sentence according to whether you designed, conducted, or reported your study in accordance with the guidelines. So for the first example, we might see a test sentence that says the study was designed, conducted, and reported in accordance with the ARRIVE guidelines with the citation to the guideline and then a link to the supplement containing the checklist. Alternatively, maybe right now you're already writing up your study and so you weren't able to design and conduct your experiments in, in accordance with the guideline. Then you might just say the study was reported in accordance with the ARRIVE guidelines with a citation for the guideline and a link to the completed checklist in the supplement. Okay. So in class, um, one of the things that we'll be doing in our first class is using a reporting guideline to write or improve your method section. So you want to identify the appropriate reporting guideline. And again, I recommend you use one of the major guidelines or Equator or the Sayer guidelines, start there. Um, use the guideline to write or to improve your method section. And again, if your guideline does have an explanation and elaboration document, consult that, it will really help. And then if there are important differences between the practice recommended by the guidelines and the way that your study was designed or conducted, then you might want to start writing your limitation section to acknowledge these issues. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone.